All right, so you might think it's strange that someone could stand up for 20 minutes in a bar and talk just about corn, but that's what I'm going to do. In fact, as you heard, I've been researching corn for more than 25 years, so in fact, you might have to drag me off in a, in a couple of hours, but hopefully not. <clears throat> so why corn? What's so special about corn? Well, for research, about 100 years ago, when people started to use genetics as a tool to understand living things, um, it was, a decision was made to focus on a small number of species, right? Rather than trying to study everything, people thought that we could just study a few plants, a few animals, and focus on those, and then you can sort of make more progress because we develop tools for those, those things. So you may have heard that people studying human diseases, for example, use fruit flies as a model, and in plants it was decided to use corn. That was one of the models that we use. So why corn? Well, as you know, you're all eating and drinking corn tonight, and thanks a lot to our communications department for arranging that. Uh, the corn is actually the number one crop in the world. So last year, believe it or not, on this planet, we produced more than a hundred, a billion tons of corn. And don't ask me to tell you what that looks like, but I know it's a lot. So we make a lot of corn. And actually the US is the biggest producer, about 30% of global corn is made in the US, and the export market is worth about $20 billion. So corn is important for the US economy. But for my interest, the thing about corn is it's genetically it's very diverse. And so we can learn a lot about genetics by studying this diversity. If you bought corn in the fall, this Indian corn, you've probably seen it in the supermarket, you know that there's many different colors and shapes and sizes. All of that is controlled by genes, and that's what we study. We want to know how, how, how the genetics controls the plant traits. So that's why corn. That's why I'm talking about corn. The other question I often get, and you know, my wife actually is not a scientist in there, so I hang out with a lot of non-scientists. Non and people say, well, how did you become a scientist, or why are you a scientist? And that, the answer to that is much easier. In fact, the, the answer is I had no choice. And I, I had no choice because, you know, actually my parents were not scientists. None of my friends growing up with, when I was growing up were scientists. I didn't know any scientists. But I was just born with this uncontrollable desire to know how things work in the world around me. So I want to, I want to tell a little story to illustrate that. So when, when I was um, uh, around four or five, so this is one of my earliest memories, uh, my, brother, my brother's favorite toy was a teddy bear that would play lullabies, and he would use this, you know, if he needed to go to sleep, you know, the, this teddy bear had a string in the back, and he'd pull the string and release it, and he would play a lullaby, and he would go to sleep. <laughs> so I asked my mom, how, how does this work? And she would say, well, it's easy. You pull the string, and it plays a tune. So, but, you know, I was never satisfied with that answer. So one day, you know, I was alone, and found the teddy bear, and found a pair of scissors, and decided to do a little surgery. So I, I care, very carefully put up on the teddy bear, and inside was a little plastic box, and that was attached to the string. So I pulled the string, and now the plastic box was making music. So that I knew the music came from the box. <clears throat> so then I opened this box, and inside there were like 50 pieces of metal that were turning and churning and making music, and that was really cool. So I thought, oh, what happens if I take one of those out? And at one point, the spring expanded and 50 pieces of metal flew into the air. <laughs> then I realized Teddy was not going to be making music anymore, <laughs> right? So I, what I did, I took all the pieces, stuffed them back inside, and hid the Teddy under, under my bed, right? And then just, nothing had happened. Like When my brother was looking for a Teddy, a teddy that night, I, I don't know. I don't know where I went to. So that night, he cried himself to sleep. and. Uh, but, you know, he got over it in a few days. Then he found the disemboweled teddy bear under my bed and, and punched me in the face. And then we made up and we've been good friends ever since. Yeah. So, you know, what does this have to do with corn? Well, in fact, the way we study corn is we like to take it apart. We want to know how the plant grows and develops, where the leaves come from, where the ears come from. And to do that, we don't want to look at the ears when they're like this, like fully formed. We want to look at them when they're tiny, right? When they're first being made. So this is this field of study is called developmental biology, and we do that. Sometimes we do that literally with forceps and tweezers. And people in my lab who are here have spent about the last two weeks pulling apart thousands of corn plants to, to find the, those little ears. 
And uh, sometimes we do it using genetics. So this wonderful tool, we can identify mutations in plants. And a mutation is, is a plant where one of the genes has been broken. And in that case, if you have a mutation and you see that the growth of the plant is altered, then you can correlate that gene with controlling a certain aspect of, of how the plant is developing. So I want to introduce a couple of friends I brought up on stage tonight. <laughs> on the right, on your um, left side, you may recognize corn. So what is this plant? So it looks a little bit similar. This is actually a plant that is the ancestor of corn. So corn is a plant that was bred by humans in a process that we call domestication, sort of tamed by humans. So this, this is a plant, this is the ancestor of corn um, that grows in the wild, and then we have the modern corn. And they, they look pretty similar, um, but you notice some differences. Perhaps the main difference you will see is corn grows as a single stalk, and each plant is just going to make a single ear, and you can see it just starting to come out there, whereas this ancestor, which is um, was started to be selected to, to, to develop into corn about 10,000 years ago, is called Tiacinte, and it makes many branches, and it makes many more ears. So one plant might make 20 or more ears. So that's a, that's a big difference. And, you know, 10,000 years ago, if you were alive, this would be the plant that you were eating, right? So you might think, that's fine, well, I can eat corn, but the ears of Tiacinte, as I'll show you in a minute, I'm going to show some pictures, are really tiny. So that was a problem. So 10,000 years ago, people had to spend a lot of time um, collecting their food. Okay, so corn, <clears throat> I sometimes call, refer to as corn as the poodle of the plant kingdom. Um, are there any poodle ones here tonight? Hopefully not. Okay, but I can assure you, no, no poodles are going to be harmed in the telling of the story. But I want to tell a little story. So, <clears throat> so poodles, as you know, are perfectly adapted to their natural environment, right? The natural environment of a poodle is a suburban living room, right? Where they're pampered, they're fed, they go to the hairdresser, right? That, that's the poodle's life. Now imagine you took that poodle and put it into a real wild environment, like you released it in Yellowstone National Park or in the Serengeti in Africa. That poodle probably would not last very long because it's lost the instincts, the ability to protect itself, to feed itself, right, to survive. The same is actually true of corn. So much in the way that humans have bred selected poodles, we also selected corn. So, so think about a time that you've been hiking in the parks around Huntington or in the forest. I bet you've never seen a corn plant growing in the wild. And that's because it's not its natural environment. Corn cannot survive in the wild. It, it grows in, in a pampered environment, which is a farmer's field where the, where the, the fields, the weeds are killed and it gets plenty of food, fertilizer and water. Okay. okay, so I want to show a few pictures now. So you've seen the plant, but now look at the ears, right? The ears of this corn ancestor that still grows today in, in Mexico where corn was initially bred. Uh, but these ears are tiny, tiny, right? So a corn ear that you're very familiar with can have 500 or more seeds. This ancestor has about six or eight seeds. Not only that, the seeds are much smaller and they're covered in a really hard seed coat. So if you try to eat this when it's mature, you would, you would break your teeth. So, but we think 10,000 years ago, people were eating this, these seeds. They probably ground them to make flour. And we probably, we think they also pop them to make popcorn, like the popcorn here, here um, they're enjoying tonight. So the way we study corn, and we're very interested in how the ear grows and develops, we don't want to look at the mature ear, the fully developed one. We want to know where the ear comes from. This is where our forceps and scalpels come in. And we dissect ears when the plants are much younger, when the ears are really tiny. And maybe you can't see this, but this is an ear of corn when it's two millimeters in size. So it's really small. And I'm, you know, I'm showing you this just so you get the scale, but in a special microscope we have called the scanning electron microscope, 
we can put this two millimeter ear in and take an image and blow it up, magnify it, so it looks, so we can see what's going on. So actually these tiny ears, we sometimes call them in the lab, our sort of friendly term for them is baby ears, because they're like baby ears, but we've uh, trying to stop that because we got in trouble with FedEx, who were, the FedEx driver was a little bit disgusted with us when he was delivering a package that, that we've labeled, you know, what's in the box, baby ears. <laughs> Okay, yeah, I can see why you might not like that. <clears throat> so, but what's really remarkable is that even at this very early growth stage, when the ear is two millimeters, it kind of looks like a mature ear. So even very early on in development, a lot of the structures are already being made. And what you see here, you can even see individual cells, if you look closely, and they're making these little bumps. <laughs> we call them primordia. These primordia are going to make flowers, and the flowers, when they're fertilized, will make seeds. So to understand how this is made, we need to understand how this early stage is made. Now, we don't even study this whole two millimeter ear, because it's, even that is very complicated. My group focuses on a group of cells right at the tip of the ear called stem cells. Right? So you may have heard about stem cells. They're very in the news a lot. In, very important in our own bodies, right? Stem cells are involved in regenerating organs for wound healing. And there's a lot of interest in, in, in biomedicine that we could use stem cells to regenerate potentially organs for transplants and for treating certain diseases also. Well, stem cells are also critical for, for how plants grow and develop. And they divide and make all of the tissues that are required to make the, the corn here. And what you might notice is that the modern corn which has bigger ears, actually has more of those stem cells than this 10,000 year, year old ancestor of corn. Right? So that gave us an idea that if we could somehow control the number of stem cells, maybe we could make these ears even bigger. Wouldn't that be cool? Right, so how do we do that? So first thing we had to do was to try to find a gene that controlled the number of stem cells. And this is where our collection of mutants come in. So I'm going to show you a mutant corn. I don't know if you've ever seen corn like this before. It's pretty bizarre, but this is a naturally occurring mutant. We got this from, uh, from some corn breeders. And it's a little hard to know what's going on here, but you can see that the ear is very bizarre, very disorganized. It's short, it's fat, it's, the kernels are really messed up. But if we look at this again very early in development, by looking at this very early stage, what you see is that the stem cells at the tip of the ear are massively overgrown, so there's many more of them. And again, if we color the stem cells, it's just uh, Photoshop, it's not a real color, real color, but just false coloring the stem cells, you see this mutant has many more stem cells than the regular corn. So this got us to thinking that maybe we can use this mutant, because we, we know the gene that's responsible for causing this mutation, maybe we could use it to control in a, in a sort of fine-tuning kind of way the number of stem cells, and then make the ears a little bit bigger. So, so what you notice about this corn is it's much shorter, but it, the ears are also a lot wider than normal. So genes are like, you can think of a gene as a switch that you turn on and off, but it's not, genes are not really switches, they're more like a rheostat, like a volume control. You can dial it up and dial it down. So this is actually the situation where the gene is dialed all the way down. But if we dialed it back up again, maybe we could make something like this, but make just a few more stem cells and then have more rows of corn. And of course, I wouldn't be telling you that if we hadn't done it. So the way we did this, um, the way we can dial genes up and down in plants or in animals also, is with a, a really incredible new technology called CRISPR, which also has been in the news a lot. CRISPR is a tool for editing genomes that you can go into a genome, go to a specific gene, and alter that gene in very controllable ways. So this was a really revolutionary revolutionary discovery in biology about 10 years ago that the, the, um, the two scientists who discovered that were awarded the Nobel Prize last year for their discovery. 
So we use CRISPR in Clone to dial down the activity of this gene. And what happened is this. So on the left is our regular clone. In the middle of this is this mutant where this gene is dialed all the way down and it makes these very disorganized, very stubby short ears. And then this is our CRISPR clone where we've turned that gene back up again a little bit. We make more stem cells and we've made more rows of kernels. And actually these plants, each plant now can make more grain, more corn. So one simple change to the genes has made more corn. That's pretty exciting. So, you know, this is very new research. We actually published this from my lab a couple of years ago. And the varieties we work with at Cosmic Harbor are not commercial varieties. We work with some research varieties that are easy, easier to manipulate in the lab. But there are companies now very interested in this research. We're collaborating with some of them. And so this may be in, in production in a few years to improve on uh, productivity. Okay, so I just want to take a step back. So I've shown you that with this CRISPR manipulation, we can make more corn. And, you know, sometimes I talk about corn and people say, well, that's great. You know, you're finding some interesting biology. But then they say, well, you know, we have plenty of food. Why do you need to make more corn? You know, we're growing a lot of it. So I, I like to show this, this graph. And this is um, actually a graph um, of information collected by the U.S. Department of Agriculture. And on the horizontal axis here is the year. So it goes back to 1866 to the current day. And on the vertical axis is the amount of corn that an average farmer produces in the US from a certain area of land. And don't ask me why they use these horrible units, bushels per acre, and I never remember what that means. So I just wrote it on here. A bushel of corn is 60 pounds of corn. And an acre is about 90% of a football field. Right, so that's just an idea. So what we see is for about the first um, 70 years that, that the USDA was collecting records, the average farm was yielding about, about 30 bushels per acre. Then in the mid-1930s, something happened, and whoop, looks pretty good. I wish my 401k looked like this. <laughs> <laughs> now the average farmer is yielding about six times more corn per acre than they were in the 1930s. This is all through breeding, genetics, and also improving agricultural practice. But, you know, it's really only because of this that we've been able to feed the growing world's population. And in the future, we want to improve this and continue this trend because, the, you know, the, the world's population is increasing. And CRISPR is one tool in the, in the toolbox of the breeder, the geneticist that can allow us to manipulate plants and improve productivity. Um, the other thing is that, you know, we also want to make agriculture more sustainable because agriculture contributes a lot to, to um, greenhouse gas emissions through energy use and also fertilizer is very energy intensive to produce and CRISPR of other genes could potentially make agriculture also more sustainable. So I think it's a very bright future. So that's what I want to say about corn. And I just want to finish and acknowledge my group members who've worked really hard to do this work. And, and this is a picture we, a couple of months ago, we went to see this amazing, excuse the pun, it is really amazing, Broadway show called Shucked. And uh, I hope some of you out there are working with us with the tickets. So thank you very much. <laughs>